back, our next presentation is Neuroscience, Learning, Play, and Games. What's the connection? And it's presented to you by Mr. James Bauer and Daphna Shoheng. So please welcome. Good afternoon. So um, <clears throat> I'm dressed up today as a university professor, uh, by the way, in whiteface. Um, I was not in red face two days ago, by the way. If you want to talk to me about that, I'm happy to talk to you about that. It's a misunderstanding of black out. But anyway, so I am here with Daphna, who is a legitimate neuroscientist. Okay. And it turns out this is the first time I've actually announced this kind of publicly, and I am too. Okay? I never, I've actually never, I've never run a session like this before, ever in a gaming meeting, because I like to hide the fact that I actually know something about neuroscience, rather than exploit it. And so part of what this conversation is about, in fact, this is gonna be a conversation. What we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce ourselves, who we are, kind of what we know, what domain of neuroscience we interact with, and then what we want to know is what you want to know or have heard about the relationship between brain, neuroscience, and gaming. Because we're, we, part of what we want to be is myth busters, maybe. And part of what we also want to do is sort of try to bring some sanity to this question. Which is a good question, but often the stuff you hear is a little insane. At least in my opinion. So, Daphna, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, we've never met before a couple of minutes ago, and she's already worried about this. So. <laughs> Hi, I'm, uh, I'm actually uh, incredibly excited to be here. This is very much uh, not my usual audience, um, and um, it's kind of fun to sit here and just have a conversation uh, at a broader level, um, rather than you know show you our latest data, which you will then criticize. Uh, so I'm, I'm a neuroscientist uh, and psychologist at Columbia University. Um, and most of my time I spend doing research, um, and the research I do is on uh, the neuroscience of learning. So I'm interested in understanding what happens in the brain when we learn um, in a very broad way. So how we um, uh, encode everyday experiences in our brain um, and what that means for how we behave in simple settings. Like when Jim said he wanted to do this panel, why I decided to say yes rather than no. Um, and uh, so I, I do this research in my lab with a team of people, graduate students and postdocs, and we use uh, a lot of different methods and we study this in, in humans. Uh, this is uh, the question of learning and neuroscience has been addressed a lot um, in non-humans, uh, but there have been uh, advances in technology, which I think we'll talk about today at least a little bit, uh, that enable us to ask these questions to some extent in humans and that's where my research lies. Um, so that alone I think explains uh, some of why I'm here at, because I'm really interested in understanding um, how learning takes place, and I think a lot of you are too from, from a different perspective. Um, the second uh, kind of uh, interest I have that's emerged in the last few years as a, as a sort of cognitive neuroscientist is how what we're learning about the brain impacts us as a society. Um, and so when I, as part of my teaching at Columbia, I teach a seminar on, uh, called Cognitive Neuroscience and the Media. Uh, so most of you uh, may, may have noticed uh, there's a real uh, fascination, which I um, share with understanding the potential of neuroscience in illuminating broader questions like who we are, why we buy Pepsi versus Cola, a lot of really broad questions. Um, and in the seminar, we examine to what extent is the science nowadays in a position to inform these kind of broad uh, interest questions, um, and where are the limits of the science? And so especially, I think, with human brain imaging, which has really become uh, 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 very popular, um, uh, what, a lot of what we do there is discuss sort of the, what, what the science can tell us and when it gets overextended. Um, and so that's another um, uh, reason I'm, I'm here with you today. Uh, and I just want to say, especially on the comments, of, uh, to, to make a comment about technology, there's a question I get often from um, just friends and uh, educators, and they say things uh, like, you know, I'm being told that the fact that my kid is playing with an iPad all the time is changing my child's brain. Is that true? And I say, of course it's true. <laughs> um, sitting here today is changing your brain and everything we do uh, changes our brain and how our brain changes in response to our experiences 
changes how we behave. Uh, and so I think really what we'd like to do today, or what brought me here today, is partly to ask the question, um, or, or ask what questions exist beyond that, beyond that obvious question. Why should you do, should you, and why should you care about, for, for your community, about what happens in the brain? What can it tell you about the things that you care about uh, beyond the fact that that obviously happens? And what can we as scientists, um, what potential do we actually have to, to illuminate uh, those questions? Great, thank you. You can see why she was invited. Um, <laughs> Now I'll try to justify myself. Um, so some of you here know, actually, how many of you have been to Wyville or consider yourself Wyvillians? Great. So for actually 30 years, I've been building games for learning in virtual spaces. First one I launched was in 1985, actually. And Wyville was launched in 1999. We have seven and a half million users. You know, it's been really successful, et cetera. During that whole period of time, however, I've also been a computational neurobiologist. So computational neurobiologist, and which is a field that I sort of helped found, um, is a neurobiologist that uses computer models of the brain to try to figure out how it works. Now my personal view is that modeling without being connected to experimental science is a form of Friday night entertainment. Um, and that therefore, if you're building models and they can't be connected to experimental science, then you're off in some, potentially off in some kind of fantasy land. So in fact, my only legitimate badge, to use your terminology, is that I'm a, I'm a, uh, have a PhD in neurophysiology. So that means the only thing I can legitimately do is stick electrodes into neurons and record their potentials. So everything I'm doing with Wyville, actually everything I'm doing with computational neuroscience, is I'm not legitimately supposed to be doing, which I know a number of people in this room already believe. So, um, that's my background. And I can also tell you that my interest in building simulation-based virtual worlds came out of the fact that I've been building simulation-based software for figuring out how the brain works for many years. In fact, um, I built a system called Genesis, which is now used around the world for people to build realistic models of neural circuits. So that's my background. Because I also believe in connecting experiments and experiments connected to modeling, in my laboratory, I've done a very wide range of experimental techniques from electrophysiology to neuroanatomy to neuropharmacology to brain slice preparations. I'm one of the people that invented multi-single unit recording techniques where you record from many neurons simultaneously. I actually have patents on some of that technology. Um, and also I've done MR, MRI. Okay, so if you're model-based and theory-based, then you do what you need to do to keep driving the theories and the models, and that means a whole bunch of experimental stuff. So that means that I'm sort of uh, a neuroscience dilettante, which I don't think is a bad thing. Anyway, that's who I am. So I'd like to start the questioning off. So we want your questions. What you should be thinking about is what have you heard, what do you think, what do you suspect, what would you like to know from two neurobiologists about anything, you know, no problem, but especially about the business that you're in. So I'd like to start out by asking myself, this is the only question that's gonna come from up here. Daphne, are there humans that have goat brains and humans that have sheep brains? <laughs> you don't have to answer that question. All right. So that's my question. Um, we'll keep that as a mystery answer for the for the end of the well, session. The basic answer is no. Right. Basically, that's basically the answer. Is to no. the best of my knowledge. To the best of your knowledge. No. Yeah. You'd be surprised. Anyway. Yes. Back. The Fletcher. Go ahead.
So the question is, um, is there potentially a future use of games to deal with serious uh, biochemical, psychological disorders like depression, uh, et cetera? Okay. That's, okay. So I mean, I think I think that that's a great. It's a great question for starting out because it really, um, it's, before giving you my my opinion uh, on an answer, just to highlight what to unpack that a little bit. Right. So um, I think. It, for me, as somebody who's not a, a, a game or a game developer, then the question is, well, what, what can you do with games? Um, and it seems to me that what you can do with games is get people to engage in certain behaviors and experiences. Um, so the answer then would be that to the extent, to the extent that we know as scientists, behavioral and neuroscientists, to the extent that we know which behaviors we want to uh, exercise that we think will help in these clinical disorders, then one could do them with paper and pencil and one could do them in a game and we can discuss, and, and I think there's some obvious answers and maybe some less obvious ones, what are the advantages of uh, doing it in sort of uh, in, in the context of a game. Um, I think where we are in the science right now, uh, especially with mental disorders, uh, is that we are still so much in the dark in terms of understanding which behaviors we need to actually be reinforcing and exercising and engaging in order to uh, make a change. So the um, you know, first and basically last line of therapy is mostly pharmacological. We can draw very um, uh, vague uh, lines between the dots of what you know some of the pharmacology does to what the behaviors are. And we can, I think we're at the stage where we can come up with some ideas for which behaviors might make a difference. And that's something that we as, as scientists do and are, and are testing, uh, but I think we're not at a point now where we know, where I can tell you, you know what, if you get, take someone with schizophrenia, they have troubles, um, they have problems uh, often anticipating uh, good things. So if we develop a game that makes them do that, that'll help the disease. It's a, it's an hypothesis, but I think the, where the science is that we don't, we don't know the answer. Um, but when we have the answer, will this be a great platform for helping implement it? I think there probably is a future there. Um, but I, but it's not, I think we're not there yet in terms of uh, just the science itself, unfortunately. So let me just unpack that just because I think it's a really strong point. Um, it's important for you all to realize really how much in the dark neuroscientists are about how the brain really works. Okay, you might get the impression by reading the New York Times or by listening to someone that's selling you a brain training uh, game that we're very close to understanding the complexity of the nervous system and how it actually works. And the answer is, I believe, we're actually remarkably far from being able to tell you as a gamer what you want people to do. One thing I can say for sure, don't rely on your intuition. Okay? Because the brain, it turns out there's a long history of people believing intuitively that the nervous system does X or Y, and therefore you can do this, and it turns out not to be right. So we're getting there, maybe, but we got a ways to go. Can I just add one quick comment to that, just to um, maybe counterbalance that a little bit? But at, at the same time, a lot of the drugs we're using today started being used without people understanding why they worked. Right. So, and that's and that was a much more dangerous game to play. Um, than, <laughs> than developing games that may or may not work, right? So I think, you know, as a scientist and as a citizen, what I'd like to see is people taking, taking into account the science rather than their intuitions. I don't think it's there yet, but I think that's, you know, that's where we want to start. Um, and that's a, that's a good start. And so I think just because we don't yet know how to make those connections, I, I, you know, it doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about it. Um, because certainly other, in, other uh, industries such as the such as pharmaceutical industries are thinking about it too. Yeah, and one more point about that, and and, and that is that um, you can actually properly design, you can actually make games that can help provide maybe some of these answers. If the games are actually not didactically assuming ahead of time what the answer is, and if they're metered and measured and assessed in the right way, so actually we use Weibull in this way. We have a project now with Massachusetts School of Professional Psychiatry to actually figure out by engaging kids in different types of activities around mental health and mental well-being, 
uh, figuring out what might work and might not work based on looking at the game as a kind of experiment. Okay? So but that's, of course, very different than putting your first slide up and saying, here's an MR. It says that if you activate the uh, frontal executive area while you're activating this, then for sure that means that you're going to be able to deal with PSD, PSTD and it's going to go away. That's a very different sort of scenario. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. What does neuroscience now say about Chicksen and Holly's notion of flow? How does it correlate to neurotransmitters, and et cetera? Is there a wonderful cascade that feels good neurotransmitters, or what? What's going on? So I think the question is, what does neuroscience today say about the humors that were originally proposed by the Greeks uh, 2,000 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> is that the question? I think I was going to take a shot at this. So um, the part of the area, um, uh, sort of broader area that I, that I work on has to do with, you know, the concept of it has to do with motivation. Um, and the, the neuroscience of motivation has changed dramatically, I'd say, in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, so whereas we had no idea how to start looking at the neural mechanisms of motivation probably 15, 20 years ago, there happens to have been sort of a slice that has to do with anticipating good stuff where there's been a lot of progress, mostly driven by originally work in computational neuroscience and now and then, and then ported to sort of human neuroscience. So on one hand, I think that, that starts getting at flow a little bit, uh, at least in terms of uh, psychological theory that have linked motivation and flow. Um, and so that highlights some circuits that are probably relevant and some neurotransmitters that are probably relevant, um, which is a very early start. Um, but I think that's basically where we're at. I, I could, we, nobody knows what actually happens. What is the actual you know, mechanism? Which is something we really talk about a lot. In neuroscience. Now, how, how exactly does it work? So you know, which we do know a lot of other things. We know to some extent how memories are formed between two neurons. We don't even know where to start explaining something at a really deep biological level uh, in, in terms of flow. There's, there's a really quick, there's a really inter important way to think about neuroscience that we've been, we've been not, big, we're primates, right? So it's not a big surprise that we thought that cognition and mentation and all that is a really important and interesting thing because that's what we do, okay? Um, but also there's been a very long history through thousands of years of assuming, using as a metaphor, whatever is the current cool technology of the day. Okay, so when aqueducts were amazing, it was flows. When it was, you know, uh, railroad lines, it was railroads. Uh, digital computers, it was digital computers. You know, now it's distributed analog, uh, parallel, concurrent, blah, 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 etc. The problem, one of the problems in neuroscience for years is that people forget their metaphors. And they actually think it's the real thing. We, the brain is an unbelievable device. 10 to the 14th components, just the neurons, burns glucose. It doesn't generate enough heat to keep itself warm. Okay? Modern cheap chip manufacturers all about controlling the heat. Okay? So just keep that in mind. I don't know if any physicists in the room, but keep it in mind when you think about the problem we've taken on solving. This is a phenomenal machine. We don't even know what type of machine it really is. And therefore, metaphorical sort of explanations for what's happening, you have to be aware of their kind of metaphors. Anyway, let's go over here because I, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question is, should gamers be monitoring their dopamine levels as a way to test the quality of your game? <laughs> Isn't that the question? I think it's a question. Right. So, okay, so there are two questions here, right? I think one is, 
the one Jim's asking, which is why do you, why why do you all why should you care? <laughs> Um, and the first question was, is, do we know something at the scientific, you know, given that we do care, um, whether we should or shouldn't, is there uh, evidence, is, is it true that sort of feeling that sense of engagement in a task uh, causes do dopamine release and that that, and, and that, that is addictive? Um, and that's, that's a very, um, it, it's, a tr this, it's a tricky question in the sense that I think that there are a lot of things that we kind of know but don't really know. Um, so is it a good guess? I think it's a, I think it's a good guess. Uh, the neurotransmitter dopamine has been linked to many, many things, um, including learning and motivation and feeling good and substance abuse and love and parenting and chocolate. And that's partly because there are a few neurotransmitters in the brain and dopamine is one of the major ones. Uh, it's special in many ways. I spent, a, 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 I'm embarrassed to admit how much time I spend thinking about what dopamine actually does. So I, it's, it's a very, it's very interesting, and in all likelihood, uh, that sense of a, a rush of being hooked, of being engaged, is going to end up being linked to dopamine in one way or another. I don't think that's actually been shown um, for this kind of context that, that you describe in any convincing way. And part of the problem is um, that where we are in human neuroscience is that the best tool we have uh, is human brain imaging. Uh, which is uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, where we measure, we, we put you in, in an MRI like you would use for scanning your knee or shoulder, except that we're measuring changes in metabolism in your brain. And what that tells us is something about oxygenation in parts of the brain. And that's great because we can measure those changes in oxygenation fairly rapidly on the order of one to two seconds. And then we can measure those changes in oxygenation while you're engaged in some kind of mental activity, whatever it may be. And most of what we know about the human brain nowadays and things that are related to technology or gaming would come from something like that. But all that's telling you is me metabolic activity in parts of the brain. So it's actually not, it cannot yet, unless someone, you know, until someone invents it, it cannot tell you anything about dopamine. So there's a difference between changes in oxygen and changes in a neurotransmitter. Um, and so the tools we have to actually measure dopamine in the human brain are pretty crude and are invasive. And so there's a lot we don't yet know. Um, so to actually answer that question, ideally what you want to do when you come up with experiments is say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if areas that have a lot of dopamine are active when someone feels that way. And then I'm going to try to take it to a non-human and actually measure dopamine release or firing in dopamine neurons. So this is a little bit technical, but I just want to highlight that the tool we have that most of us use and read about is really just, we hope, we think, really just the beginning. And in many ways, it's very primitive um, and, and not, not where we want it to be yet. So just about MR for a minute, because a lot of the stuff you see when people are selling stuff involves now showing an MR about it, OK? One way to think about what an MR is is imagine you're you know, in, a, in a space station, and you have an image of Manhattan that tells you when taxi cabs are getting, uh, uh, filling up their gas tanks, okay? And now you're trying to figure out what's going on in Manhattan by keeping track of when the taxi cabs are actually filling their gas tanks, okay? And nobody has figured out yet what the relationship is between the taxi cabs filling their gas tanks and what's actually going on in terms of the people and humans in Manhattan, except you know more of them are being carried around properly. Okay, that's the nature of the problem, and uh, you know it's important for you to know that, as you said, we do not know the relationship between the bold signal, between the signal you look at in fMRI, and what's actually going on in neurons. We don't know. It's an important area of study and research, but we don't know. There are a bunch of leaps there. One other quick thing I want to say. One of the things that I try to teach my kids, my students, and and that modeling is actually good to help you deal with. Humans are correlation machines. We assume correlation means causality. It doesn't. The relationship between correlation and causality is complicated. So even if you saw dopamine go up, for example, when you're playing somebody's game, that may or may not necessarily mean that it's doing what you think it's doing. Figuring out what it's actually doing is a much, much more complex process. Um, so just kind of paraphrasing. Not the taxi cab thing. 
<laughs> That's probably the worst analogy you've ever heard. Anyway, another question? Yeah. So I think the first question was, I'm repeating them by the way because they're, they're telecasting this or webcasting. Um, <clears throat> the first question is, can we anticipate there's a difference between doing it in the real world and doing it on a screen? The real world's more fun. Well, maybe. The second, um, right, so that was the first question. The second question is, what's the difference between being a, I hope you're not asking me, what's the difference between being a sheep and a goat? No, no, I'm curious about Okay, what's the relationship between the role you're playing and the position you are with respect to the activity and how your brain might react? And can we see that difference? Um, that's a great question because uh, it's, really, it's really a question about sort of the circumstances that, um, uh, that change the way we learn and especially the social circumstances. And, and, and I really like that question because it's, um, it's one that we, we potentially can't answer. Um, and so the answer, you know, the straight answer would come from a field of social psychology, where people ask really, to what extent does the social environment change the way people behave? And uh, they have not looked a whole lot at learning, but are, but are beginning to. Um, and it actually highlights a very new uh, uh, kind of trendy, um, forward-looking sub-area of neuroscience, uh, which is called social neuroscience, which is really uh, mostly in its infancy. Um, but basically trying to ask these types of questions, asking can we, can we ask those questions about the brain? Um, and uh, so, you know, the way you would want to, you can imagine what that experiment would look like. Um, I don't think someone, I, I don't know of an experiment that's actually addressed that question uh, head on, but that, that's a good example of something, you know, come to the lab, we can design it and we can look at that. Um, there's, um, uh, there are a number of people who are really interested in the question of how social context changes uh, brain activity in humans and how that links to behavior. Again, this, you know, this will all be correlational. It won't necessarily tell you exactly how it works, but it will start to give you a hint of, is it because, um, you, know, you can start answering questions like, on the assumption that people learn better in a social context, is that because they pay more attention, you see more uh, attention-related activation, or does it seem to hit other areas which are more motivational to the extent that you can tease those two things apart, which we're beginning to do. Um, so I think, you know, there's a whole, um, I think a really large set of questions that the scientists aren't asking because we're thinking about things from a very particular perspective, but that conversations of this kind can highlight their importance, and uh, same for different kinds of media uh, for learning. So we're in the lightning round. Um, <clears throat> you can ask a yes-no question. It has to be 140 characters or less. <laughs> By the way, I personally try to avoid any answer that you can get 140 characters. So yes, no, and we'll answer yes, no, or maybe. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, for a thriving community of practice in every field. Is there a thriving community of practice of dialogue, two-way dialogue, between neuroscience and practitioners back to the first question? So is there a, is there a, a thriving uh, community of neuroscientists who are talking to practitioners uh, directly? Two-way, getting okay, input from, from the first question. Yeah, getting input from, say, this community, and uh, the only person I know that's actually a legitimate neuroscientist and a legitimate person in this community, I only know one of them. And I have this conflict constantly. So I have, it's, it's a high baud rate conflict. Um, but other than that, I would say not as much as there should be. Yeah, I mean, yeah, my one word answer would be no. Thank you. You could, but it requires honesty. Okay? <laughs> All right? Uh, honesty turns out to be really important, especially at the beginning of things. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. Do you see uh, EEG, electroencephalograph, a more crude form of, uh, of brain uh, detection and being available at the consumer electronics level for use in video games? Uh, 
uh, do we believe, the question is, do we believe any of the people that are currently using EEGs as a way to play video games that they actually know what they're doing? The answer is, you probably don't know about this, I know about this, no. Because any time that someone puts a cap on your head and says, okay, now I'm gonna show you how much your, we can read your brain waves, please close your eyes. Okay, that's bullshit. <laughs> By the way, EGs are even worse than MR in terms of knowing what the heck is going on and what the significance is in terms of getting back down to the basics. They're another level of abstraction in some sense. Yeah. And I built models of EEG systems, so yeah, go ahead. Is it possible to teach foreign language to children in video games? Yeah, I'd say the one-word answer is yes, but I just, just to send you to look at the work of Patricia Kuhl, who's looked at learning in children from how they learn from real people versus screens. And a lot of things you see with real people you do not see with screens. So that... Okay, yeah. Any uh, names you throw out people publishing in social neuroscience that are remotely related to what we do in this room? I would, I would just Google social neuroscience. I can mention a number of names, but it's um, so Kevin Oxner, Matt Lieberman um, are the two um, that come to mind most quickly. Uh, but there are, because it's a new field, there's uh, quite a bit to read about the field, which doesn't usually happen, and they can basically lay out, map out kind of what kind of questions are being addressed. Not to pick on anybody, but one of the statements I heard last night was, uh, we shouldn't worry anymore about whether games actually change humans and do what we think they do, they do, just forget about it. That's not true. So, in fact, you guys should all be looking. Uh, and I can give, I mean, if you're interested in why Belly, Yasmin's Kafai is publishing an entire book, MIT Press this summer, on why I didn't write, she wrote, all basic research uh, from an educational point of view. You should, you really need to be digging in the literature to see what is known and what is not known. And there are some people now doing some meta-analysis it's interesting. A guy named Doug, uh, what's his last name, at, Van, at Vanderbilt, who's doing a meta-analysis of the literature about games and learning uh, that's out there and what, where the gaps are. You guys should definitely, Doug Clark is his name, C-L-A-R-K-E, you should definitely know about that and look at that. Because in fact, it's, we don't know. And there's a lot to be known. One more question before they throw us out. Let's do one more. That be, that, that's 10. When you go like that and say that at 10. That's zero? Okay, so one more. Quick, quick, quick. Yeah, quick. So if we move from the mouse to touch, are we moving more in the direction of stuff games that brains care about? I don't know. Maybe. <laughs>